come together in your word. We pray, O oh Lord, that as we seek your truth, that as you've given us the Holy Spirit, who is the spirit of truth, that we will understand and we will believe and we will live the truth. Father, we do thank you for Christ, your Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, our, our King and our God. Thank you that he is an anchor that is, is sure and steady. That we have the full assurance of faith. And Lord, when we do have those times of questioning and concern and doubt, we pray that the light of your word and the gospel of Jesus Christ will shine bright in our hearts and minds and give us that confidence in Christ. Forgive us when our faith is small. I thank you, Lord, that, that you remain faithful even when we do not remain faithful. You are great. You are glorious. We thank you that you are still in the the days of salvation, the days of saving souls. And we pray, Father, if there are any here listening and watching that are not saved, that the Spirit of God would convict and regenerate them, give them life. And also that we pray that we might be a witness day by day, casting out the seeds of the gospel and watering, and Lord, that you give the increase. You build your church, O oh, oh Lord, that, that you will add to your number those who are the lost sheep you found, the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and the other sheep that you said must be also found, which includes all of us. So we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Let's open our Bibles to Romans chapter 8, oh, sorry, Romans chapter 9. <clears throat> Romans chapter 9. <clears throat> We're going to begin right into the theme, the, the, the wonderful power of God's promise. Realizing again from his word that his promises are assured. And in verse six of chapter nine, we read, but it is not that the word of God has taken no effect. Of course, we're coming into the, the middle of a, a theme or a thought. And in the, the New King James translation, it has the word but starting this verse. And so the question is, why would Paul make this statement? But it is not that the word of God has taken no effect. Well, we need to remember the previous statements that Paul has made concerning his heaviness, his continual sorrow for his kinsmen, fellow Israelites, those who have rejected Jesus as Messiah, who are not saved. God gave to Israel in the past certain advantages, as we saw last time. These advantages make uh, them ready for the Christ. It was all for that purpose of bringing Christ into the world. But instead, they handed Jesus over to be crucified. And so then comes the question that if God had given to Israel these advantages, and yet they had their Messiah put to death, did that mean God's word failed? Or to bring it even more personal, if individual Israelites are not saved but condemned, then does it mean the word of God has failed? Did his promises given even as far back as Abraham and then to Moses and the children of Israel, did his promises, did his word fail? 
And Paul answered, no. That is where the word but comes in, but it is not that the word of God has taken no effect. God's promises have not failed. There are those that would say that this passage highlights the problem with Israel, and in some form or fashion, there was and is a problem. But before that problem is corrected, we need to highlight what seems to be a problem in some people's minds with the word of God. And of course, we know it's not a problem with the word, but with one's understanding of that word. More importantly, God's word is given in the Old Testament. Because along with all the advantages given to Israel outlined in this chapter, the beginning of chapter 9, there is one more which Paul pointed out, and this is back in chapter 3, Romans chapter 3. <clears throat> In verse 1 we read, what advantage then has the Jew, or what is the profit of circumcision? And then he says in verse 2, much in every way, chiefly, because to them were committed the oracles of God. For what if some did not believe? Will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? Certainly not. Indeed, let God be true, but every man a liar. Now, there are some unbelievers who basically follow a broken form of reasoning as to the truthfulness of the oracles of God, the promises, the scripture is really overall what is being said here. And their reasoning kind of goes like this. I don't believe it, therefore it's not true. I don't believe it, therefore it's not true. They might not say it that way, but really, when they really get down to it and you understand what they're thinking, that is what they're saying. Because I don't believe it, it's not true. And that's far different than saying it's not true, therefore I do not believe it. They might be wanting to say the same thing, but they're in truth not the same. The one who says it is not true can say that about something outside of the Bible even, and they would be could be correct to say it, but for someone to say, I don't believe it, therefore it is untrue, what they're doing is they're taking the place of God whom they claim to not believe in. Going back to Romans 3 here, in Romans 3 verse 2, chiefly, or above every other advantage that was given to Israel in the Old Testament was God's word itself, the oracles of God, the word of God, the promise, the prophecies, all that was given, it was above all important, and it was a chief advantage. The question then that is put forward in Romans 3 verse 3, that if God made such a promise and many generations of people in Israel did not believe God's promises, as we know, reading through the Old Testament, there was always just a minority who were truly believers, if that is the case, then does it mean that their unbelief makes God's faithfulness and to his word just null and empty? If they were promised to be a blessing instead because of their unbelief became a curse, such as when they were sent into exile, and then when they crucified the Lord Jesus Christ, then did God somehow fail? Did his promises fail? Or another way, did his word become null and void? Now this would be putting both God himself and his promises to Israel on the questioning stand and putting a doubt within the minds of listeners and hearers. So how does Paul answer? Well, note there in chapter 3, just as he emphasizes in chapter 9 he says this in verse 4 God forbid God forbid then he adds yes let God be true but every man a liar God is a God of truth it's man who's the deceitful one 
God is a God of faithfulness and he's a God of truthfulness. There is a difference between a person who believes, say, but struggles at times with questions and, and seeking for answers concerning our God and an unbeliever who does not believe because of the sinfulness and the deception of their heart. For who can truly grasp the, the perfect truthfulness of God except it's given to them by the spirit of truth, which is the Holy Spirit, which is God. It doesn't matter what a person says or, or believes or does not believe about God and his promises to his people. God is the truth. It's man that is the liar. Man has the problem. Not God's word. Not God's promise. Not God himself. The deadly problem is man, the heart of man. It's desperately wicked. Lying seems to be a way of life for most people as evidence of that truth. In a book with the title, The Day American Told the Truth, the author has written that 91% of those surveyed lied routinely about matters they consider trivial. 36% lie about important matters. 86% lie regularly to parents. Let's talk about that one after. 75% to friends, 73% to siblings, and 69% to spouses. But God, the Father, will not lie because he is the author of truth. And he cannot lie. God, the Son, will not lie for he is the way, the truth, and the life. The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, will not lie because he is the spirit of truth. And this enforces the fact that what one sees in human history or in the present and also in days to come, that God's word has in no way failed. And it will not fail. All that God said he will do, he will do it. The power of God's promises remain. And if this is so, then how does Paul explain concerning Israel? Go back to chapter, chapter 9, again, verse 9, or verse 6. <clears throat> One of the things that I find, maybe you have noticed it as you go through the writings, the epistles of Paul, is that when he deals with a question, he often deals with that question with an answer and then brings out another question. Or if there's a a concern or there's a problem he works with one and then it brings out another one and this is what we find in this portion of scripture is question upon question and we can understand that because even now as we study through the scriptures and study through the themes of god's word and passages like that that have been dealt with and you have concordant uh, commentaries and books written on the subjects that are Within the pages of God's word, we still find ourselves asking, well, what about this? What about this? What about that? And this is what we find here. In verse 6, again, the second part of it says, For they are not all Israel who are of Israel, nor are they all children, because they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac your seed shall be called. That is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come, Sarah shall have a son. Now the second part of verse 6 through verse 7 introduces why he believes that the denial of Israel nullifies the promise of God to Israel. That is, that the question that began was, has God forsaken his people? Has God forsaken and has his word failed? He wants to clearly show no is the answer. But then the question comes up, then why are there those who are of Israel who aren't saved? Should not the promises of God have brought salvation? One of the first things to understand in this is that, and we've been looking 
in just the last couple of weeks in our Bible study on the covenants, that there is the covenant that was given by God to Moses, and that covenant was not a salvatory covenant. Whereas the covenant in Christ is the salvatory covenant. It's the covenant of salvation. And so the confusion often lies with first understanding that. But there, of course, is more to that. A professor of New Testament studies at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. That's a big name. His name's Douglas Moo. And don't let the description of him and the... The name of the school, Scare You Awake. He's a very humble teacher, man of God. He gave a forward title to this section of Romans 9. I think it helps us to begin to understand what is being written about. And that is, the four words are, the Israel within Israel. The Israel within Israel. Or as the Holy Spirit says even far better here in the scriptures, they are not all Israel who are of Israel. Think of it this way. In the USA, we can be sure it'd be the same here in Canada. They are in a battle concerning illegal aliens, not green men from outer space aliens, real people, but they are those who are within the country without going through the legal process. There are those who don't want to call them illegals, but undocumented. Whatever they are called, there are people who enter the country illegally. They don't go through the legal hoops in order to become a citizen. In the last year alone, border patrols, say on the southern border, that's of the USA and Mexico, have encountered 1.7 million people trying to enter in illegally. It's estimated that close to 12 million, if not more, are living illegally in the USA right now. In short, you have a country that has two groups, those who live in the country legally and those who do not. You have among the first group, the largest number who are true, legal, law-abiding citizens, then you have those that even though most of them may be very nice people, they are not citizens of the country. They are within the country illegally. This is an earthly way how we might describe what Paul means here. Not everyone who lives in Israel, even born from the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, is of Israel. Take it further, not everyone born with the blood of Abraham, born into a Jewish family, physical Israel, is of the spiritual Israel, that is, they're not saved. The individual man, woman, or child, that there are those who are chosen of God and are saved, they're, they're brought into the kingdom of Christ just as Paul the Apostle was. And then there are those who are not. Paul is answering those who would have made no distinction. For many, they were thinking that they were heirs of the promise simply because they were descended from Abraham, that they, they had their ticket to heaven, as it were. They, that they were of Israel because of Jacob, who was the first to be given the title. So like some children, for example, would be those who are born into a Christian family. They pointed at their genealogy, that they had Christian parents, and therefore they are Christian. For years, and it's been changing now over the years, it's not as common, but it was commonly believed by many that I've been, especially in the States, born in North America. I'm a um, say U.S. citizen, I am a Christian. I'm of a godly nation. And here the distinction is being made, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel. Now what must be denied here is that one is saved to, due to the blood type that's flowing through their veins. That's what Paul is denying. 
Paul is denying what some have referred to as national salvation. Even under the old covenant, when God gave to the nation as a whole the advantages that have been mentioned in chapter 3 and also chapter 9, it was not, again, the means of saving the nation as a whole. There were, there were many who we read through the, the books, even of the time period of, of the judges and what led up to the exiles of a rebellion against God, not an acceptance of God, a rejection of his word. And God would reject them because of that and send them into exile. It was not that they were immediately accepted by God for, for it in every way because of that. Yes, the whole nation was chosen by God. He chose them for certain purposes and reasons, which the advantages were meant to, to focus upon and amplify, and amplify most of all the bringing in of Christ into the world. But it was never given to give to anyone a false impression that if they were just simply a physical descendant of Abraham, they had the place reserved in heaven. That's why Jesus could say to some who were the religious teachers, you are of your father the devil, even though they stated that they themselves were the descendants of Abraham, which they were. We see this and find this in John chapter 8. John chapter 8. In John chapter 8, Jesus is having a discussion, if we can call it that. And it's between Jesus and some teachers and rulers in Israel. In chapter 8. In verse 37, it says, I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have seen with your father. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me. A man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds of your father. And they said to him, we are not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. You are of your father the devil, and the desire of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. He is a liar and the father of it. Because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears God's word. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. Jesus was speaking to those who were of the genealogy of Abraham. And saying this this must have made these religious and political leaders in israel so angry just boiling hot mad to deny them their rightful place as the seed of abraham was worse than calling them gentile dogs in fact it was worse as jesus states that their unbelief and desire to kill him is evidence that they are not of abraham's seed they're not of abraham in the way in which to be of Abraham is most important, not of the physical, but of the promise. If they believed in Jesus Christ, it would be evidence that they were of the promise. They were instead of their father, the devil. They were not of God. They couldn't hear God. They couldn't obey God because they were not of God. They were not following 
the way of Abraham, who believed God and was counted unto him as righteousness. So the ones Jesus is talking to, they were legal citizens of Israel. They were descendants of the fathers of Israel, but they were not of Israel. Those who in the Old Testament believed with hope in the Christ who was to come like Abraham. Now here he stands, the one that Abraham looked forward to with anticipation and joy, and he's standing right in front of them, but they're blind. They can't see him. They're deaf. They cannot hear him. They're dead. They can't believe in him. The truth isn't in them. Not all of this, not all of those who belong to Israel in a physical sense belong to Israel in a spiritual sense is what is being stated. That's what Paul is getting at. He's saying, has, the question is, has God rejected his people? No. He says later on, as we looked at last time, that, that he himself is evidence that God has not rejected his people, Israel, because he is one and he is a child of Abraham and God has saved him by his grace. But not all are saved. And so they were not of that spiritual Israel. Paul illustrates this back in Romans chapter 9 and verses 7 through 9. Nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac your seed shall be called. That is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. So to define Israel, Paul begins at the start. God call of and the promises to Abraham. See, this is where we learn the basis for both the physical and the spiritual meaning of Israel. See, this, the assumption was, if you were of the seed of Abraham, you were just immediately the spiritual seed of Abraham. And there were many who believe that, and there are many who believe that to this day. That if, I'm not speaking of Christians, I'm just speaking in terms of those who are uh, Israel or Jewish by blood, they always look back to their connection to Abraham and make that not only just physical, but the spiritual application. That because they are of the seed of Abraham, then they are accepted of God. And that's the assumption. The seed of Abraham. Yet Paul says not everyone, every child of Abraham in the physical sense is a child of in the saving sense, salvation is not a birthright. And so again, just read that very, very slowly and carefully again. Verse 7, nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham, but in Isaac your seed shall be called. That is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as seed. Now note the distinction between physical and the spiritual descent of being children. It comes from, the, in this passage, the quote that's being taken in this, where at this time I will come, Sarah shall have a son, or in Isaac your seed shall be called, and so on. Uh, it's taken from Genesis, the book of Genesis, chapter 21, and verse 2. It says, in Isaac, your seed shall be called. Note also that verse 8 specifies, those who are the children of the flesh are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. The important thing to note is that the emphasis is not on the flesh, but it's on the promise. You recall how Abraham had physical relations with his wife's maid, Agar, and she had a son, and they named him Ishmael. And Abraham at first looked at that son as a fulfillment of God's promise. 
But God told him Ishmael was not the child of promise. God did promise to both Ishmael and to Isaac that they would have children themselves also and be fathers of great nations. So God did promise to both Ishmael and to Isaac that they would have children, be the father of great nations. So there was a promise given to Ishmael, but the promise was not given to Ishmael. Ishmael and his heirs were physically equal with Isaac. They were both the seed of Abraham. What was the difference? Well, the difference is the spiritual promises of God that were not given to one, but were given to the other. The power of God's promise that it had not failed is seen then by the fact that individual Jews like himself were being saved. Just because not everyone who claimed to be an Israelite of the physical seed of Abraham believed in Jesus as the Messiah did not make God's promises void. Rather, his salvation, the growth of the church in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and into the uttermost parts of the world was proof that God had not failed, that his word had not failed. For not everyone born of Israel in the flesh was of the spiritual. Not everyone of Israel is of Israel. People of God's promise were being saved. And so we learn the purpose of this in verse 10. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac, for the children not yet being born, not having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand, not of works, but of him who calls, and was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Now, as I mentioned, a question brings up questions, doesn't it? A problem brings up problems all through the writings of the epistles. And here we have again a question. Well, if God has not rejected and if God has not failed in his promises, what's the purpose? What's the purpose of God's promise? The question that Paul is answering concerning God's word failing concerning Israel could be explained in a contemporary and present way for us. Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. But as we look over the, maybe we call it the landscape of the church, we don't always see this. We don't always see this, what seems to be Christ going forth in, in power and might and the gates of hell crumbling. We don't always seem to see it. In some places of the world, it almost seems as though the church is almost extinct. There have been times in history where in which the church seemed to be the one that was fallen. Did the promise that Jesus would build his church in the gates of hell prevail? Has that failed? In light of these things, we could come to the place where we could ask that question. The same question as given here. Is this word failed? Is this the evidence that God has not kept his promise? Do these sad truths dismiss the faithfulness of God who said he will be with us always and, and strengthen the church? What answer could we give in the face of church divisions and, and sin within the church? Has God forsaken? Has his word failed that he would build a church that, that Satan's hosts will tremble at? Well, the answer is the same. God's promise to build his church, it's not based upon the actions and the attitudes of men. 
And God's faithfulness to build his church is seen by the fact that his church is still in the world today. God is faithful. He is building his church. And it's not determined on people, but it's fully upon his own truthfulness, his own character of holiness, his faithfulness. In 2 Timothy 2 verse 13 says, if we believe not, yet he abides faithful. He can't deny himself. Deuteronomy 7, 9 says, Know therefore that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God, who keeps covenant and mercy with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. 1 Thessalonians 5, 24 says, Faithful is he that calls you, who also will do it. 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 3, But the Lord is faithful, who shall establish you and keep you from evil. It's such a comfort to know that our God is truthful and faithful. Not only when we're faithful, but even when we doubt, even when we're like the people of old and we struggle with unbelief. Even when the world is full of unbelief and mocks the truth of our God, he remains faithful to all his people, to his word, to his promises. He is God of truth and faithfulness. He's not only faithful in action, he's faithful in character. He will not be, nor can he be anything but faithful. Therefore, in him we may place our trust, and we can be 100% assured of his word. His hymn writer writes, My faith has found a resting place, not in device or creed. I trust the ever-living one. His wounds for me shall plead. In verse 10, Paul moves from one patriarch to another in order to present further this truth that God has not failed. He again develops the distinction between being born of the seed physically and being born of the seed spiritually. It simply stated, a person born of the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, again, doesn't mean that they are spiritually born again. He further illustrates this with two individuals, similar to Isaac and Ishmael. These two individuals, they have the same father. They also have the grandfather, Abraham. And the one is named Jacob. Jacob means heel grabber, as he was holding on to his twin brother's heel when they they were coming out of the womb. And it defined his character before his salvation, his regeneration. Esau, the other boy, is named that because of the skin color being reddish, reddish being of the earth. And being of the earth, we also see that in his character, that he was one who was not, did not become regenerated by the Spirit of God, born again. And these four verses, the focus is upon God's sovereign choice in them. And his purpose and his prerogative to choose one over the other. Even before these two individuals were born, while they're still in the womb, long before they were freed from the womb to get into mischief or to activity and sin against God actively, as they both did, God chose to grace one. That was Jacob. Now, he did not choose Jacob because of his race. Yeah, no, he did not choose Jacob specifically because he was of the seed of Abraham, physically. Because so was Esau. So he, God did not elect him, choose him because of him being of the seed of Abraham in the flesh. And that is revealed here to have nothing to do with God's choice, God loving Jacob or hating Esau. Being chosen and being a child of God was solely on the basis of God's grace, God's unmerited favor. And so again, it was not earthly lineage in which Jacob was chosen to be heir of the promise. It was not 
earthly or religious, but it was God's determined will alone. God had chosen one over the other before they were born, and before they were even able to do anything good or bad. Note it was according to election, which means choice and not of works. Paul supports this with scripture. Malachi 1 verse 2 is where he quotes from. Malachi 1 verse 2 says, I have loved you, says the Lord, yet you say, wherein have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord, yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Now, two opposing terms, love and hate. Some get angry here, and they kind of try to shield God from some sort of bad advertisement. But God does not need shielding here or anywhere. The truth of the matter is that God hates all workers of iniquity. And in the womb and from the womb, apart from God's grace, we were all hated by God. The holy hatred. But in the case of Jacob, God chose to continue to have holy hatred for Esau, and he chose eternally to love Jacob. And this is the same with all of us who are loved by God. He chose to love us in Christ before the world began. He chose to love us not because we were of any good worth. He chose to love us because of his grace and his sovereign purpose. He chose to love us though we deserved as sinful creatures his holy hatred. And that's where people maybe get a little off in trying to understand this and they, they, they get a little antsy about it, saying, well, hatred. Hatred is a sinful thing. Well, yes, hatred is a sinful thing within the sinful creature. But this is a holy and is a holy hatred. A holy hatred that God still has toward those who oppose him. A holy hatred that keeps the fires of hell burning for eternity. And this is what makes this election of God so amazing. That God commended his love toward us even while we were yet sinners. Even while we were yet in that state under that holy hatred of God. Another term would be the wrath of God. The holy righteous anger of God. But even while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. And as he died for us, he bore that hatred and wrath and anger for us. Why did God then choose to love Jacob and hate Esau? Why did God choose to love you? Why did he choose to love me? To know the answer is almost a diff is difficult to understand is God himself. God is love. But we're given a glimpse as to the purpose of his promise to save a people for himself, including but not limited to those of Jewish descent, but also Gentile descent and of slave descent, free men, men, women, every tribe and nation. See this as you go down in verse 23, chapter 9. And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had prepared beforehand for glory. Even us whom he called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. As he also says in Hosea, I will call them my people who are not my people, and her beloved who is not beloved. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they shall be called sons of the living God. Isaiah also cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, the remnant will be saved, for he will finish the work 
and cut it short in righteousness, because the Lord will make a short work upon the earth. And Isaiah said before, unless the Lord of Sabaoth had left us a seed, we would have become like Sodom, and we would have been made like Gomorrah. Has God's word failed? Has his promises failed? Has it failed because the nation of Israel in its past rejected the Messiah? Has God failed because not all Israel is of Israel, as Paul writes? Has God failed in his promise to save a people from every tribe, tongue, and nation? The answer is a resounding no. God's word has not failed. God's faithfulness has not failed. Jesus is building his church and all those chosen of Israel will come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God. Not one of God's promises will fail. They'll not even fall short. All the promises of God are yes and amen. All the promises are found in, they're fulfilled in Christ Jesus. When we stand on the other side of eternity, we will look and we'll say, to God be the glory. To God be the glory. Someone wrote, how large the promise, how divine. To Abram and his seed, I'll be a God to thee and thine, supplying all their need. The words of his extensive love from age to age endure. The angel of the covenant proves and seals the blessing sure. Jesus, the ancient faith confirms to our great fathers given. He takes his children to his arms and calls them heirs of heaven. Our God, how faithful are his ways. His love endures the same, nor from the promise of his grace blots out his children's name. Oh, praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you.